Dear friends, in this module of gravitation, we will discuss about some concepts of gravitation by taking up numerical problems based on the concepts. We will take up questions based on the principle of superposition. According to this principle, if we have a collection of point masses, the force on any one of them is the vector sum of the gravitational forces exerted on that mass by the other point masses. Three identical point masses each of 1 kg lie in this arrangement shown here. The radius of the circle is 1 meter. F1 and F2 represent the force on the central mass. The question is, what is the magnitude of the gravitational force on the mass placed at the center due to the two other masses? Here, G is the universal gravitational constant. The options are 2G, 3G, root 2G, root 3G. The answer over here is D. By the principle of superposition, you can see that the force is equal to the vector sum of the individual forces. This force we are talking of is the force on the central mass. The magnitude of the individual forces is equal and it is equal to G as the mass is 1 kg and the radius is 1 meter. This magnitude of the force on the central mass is given by the parallelogram law and it is equal to root f1 square plus f2 square plus 2 f1 f2 cos 60 degree. And when we calculate this, we get the answer as g root 3. This justifies the result that the answer is d. Hence, we see that the magnitude of the net force on the central mass in this case is dependent on the magnitude of the individual forces acting on the central mass and the cosine of the angle between the two forces. In this situation, you see a figure which shows four circles of same radius at the center of which lies a point mass M. Two other identical point masses lie on each circle. The center of mass of these two point masses is also shown in each case on the central axis. In which of the cases shown above is the gravitational force maximum and in which one is the gravitational force minimum. The magnitude of the force is again given by root of f1 square plus f2 square plus 2 f1 f2 cos theta. But now since the masses are identical and are at distances equal to the radius of the circle from the central mass, in all the cases, we can say that the magnitude of F1 is equal to the magnitude of F2. Hence, we see that the force on the central mass only depends on the cosine of the angle between the forces F1 and F2. Lesser the angle, greater is the force on the central mass and vice versa. Now, the two identical masses on the circle are removed and replaced by a point mass whose position and mass exactly matches the center of mass of the removed particles. In this new situation, you have to tell the gravitational force is maximum in which case and 
the gravitational force on the central mass is minimum in which case? So, we see that if two masses are replaced by their center of mass, the results are very different. This is because the force on central mass now depends only on the distance from the center of mass. The lesser the distance, more is the force on the central mass by the inverse square law. So, we learn a very important concept. In any system, we cannot replace the rest of the masses by their center of mass to find the force on the given mass. Now, we will take up some question which is based on the Newton's shell theorem states that a uniform spherical shell of matter attracts a particle that is outside the shell as if all the shell's mass were concentrated at its center. A uniform spherical shell of matter exerts no net gravitational force on a particle placed inside the shell. In this situation shown here, we have two concentric shells of identical mass which are shown. You have to tell what is the gravitational force experienced by the point object each of mass m placed at points a, b, c and d. The coordinates of all these points are shown. We can see that the force on objects at a and b are zero as they are inside the shell. Force on object C is due to the inner shell of mass M which behaves as if its mass is concentrated at the center. Force on object D is due to both the shells which behave as if their entire mass 2M is concentrated at the center. This is not in contradiction with the previous concept which we learned in the principle of superposition. Here we have not replaced the shell by its center of mass. Otherwise both the statements of the shell theorem cannot be true simultaneously. The result of the shell theorem was arrived at by taking the vector sum of the forces exerted by very small individual elements of the shell on the particle which is placed either outside or inside the shell. Now we take up questions which are based on acceleration due to gravity. In this situation, we consider a 100 gram apple falling towards the earth from a height of 10 meter from the surface of the earth. You have to find the acceleration with which the earth moves towards the apple. The solution to this question can be understood by understanding the following aspects. The earth attracts the apple with a force equal in magnitude to the force with which the apple attracts the earth. This is in accordance with Newton's third law. The distance between the center of the earth and the apple is the sum of the radius of the earth and the height of 10 meter which is approximately equal to the radius of the earth which is equal to 6.37 into 10 to the power of 6 meter. Hence the acceleration due to gravity for the apple is almost equal to 
9.8 meter per second square. Mass of the earth is nearly 6 into 10 to the power of 24 kg and mass of the apple is 0.1 kg. Using the formula for the force experienced by the earth and the apple we have ma is equal to mg and hence from this we can arrive at the acceleration of the earth which comes out to be 1.63 into 10 to the power of minus 25 meter per second square. The acceleration of the earth towards the apple is negligibly small as it is inversely proportional to the mass of the earth. This is the reason why we see objects falling towards the earth and not the earth rising to meet them. The earth seems to be stationary. In this situation, you have to tell what will be the new value of g experienced by an object which is taken from the surface of the earth to heights which is equal to r, 2r, 3r or generalizing it nr where r is the radius of the earth. The solution to this particular question can be found out by using the formulas for the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the earth and at a certain height. So we have g dash which is the acceleration at a certain height from the surface of the earth is gm by r plus h whole square while the g at the surface of the earth is gm by r square. We see that using this formula and putting the values of h given in the various cases like in the first case where h is equal to r we arrive at g dash as equal to g by 4. In the second case h is equal to 2r and we get g dash is equal to g by 9. At h is equal to 3r, g dash is equal to g by 16. Similarly, at h is equal to nr, g dash comes out to be g by n plus 1 whole square. We see here that the value of g decreases with height from the surface of the earth. The distance from the center of the earth is increasing in arithmetic progression here. That is r is to 2r is to 3r and it goes up to nr or we can say it is in the ratio 1 is to 2 is to 3 and it goes up to n. While g over here decreases as g by 4, g by 9, g by 16 and it goes up to g by n plus 1 whole square. This we see is in accordance with the inverse square law. Now in the graph shown below represents the variation of g with distance r from the center of the earth. So you can see that the answer is A because the value of G increases linearly with distance from the center of the earth up to the surface of the earth. Now we take up questions which are based on satellites. In this situation we see the orbit of Mangalyaan. Mangalyaan which is the Mars orbiter mission was sent by ISRO and it has a very highly eccentric orbit. 
it is at a distance of 420 kilometer when it is closest from the surface of the planet Mars and it is at a distance of 72,000 kilometer from the surface when it is farthest from Mars. The radius of Mars is 3,390 kilometers. What is the ratio of its velocity at perihelion and epihelion? The solution to this particular question is based on Kepler's law of areas. The angular momentum at perihelion will be equal to the angular momentum at epihelion. At perihelion, the distance can be calculated as 3390 kilometer which is the radius of Mars plus 420 kilometer which is the distance of Mangalyaan and it comes out to be equal to 4410 kilometers. Similarly, epihelion is calculated by adding the radius of Mars with the farthest distance of Mangalyaan from the surface of Mars and it is equal to 75,390 kilometer. Using the equation m v1 r1 is equal to m v2 r2, we have the relation v1 by v2 is equal to r2 by r1 and here we get that the velocity of Mangalyaan comes out to be 17 times more at perihelion as compared to at epihelion. In this situation, we see that the angular momentum of a moving object about a certain point remains conserved if the object does not experience any torque. Here, the gravitational force between the planet and the sun acts along the line joining them. So, the torque experienced by the planet is zero. Hence, the angular momentum of the planet about the sun remains constant throughout the planetary orbit which makes the aerial velocity also constant and this is the Kepler's law of areas. In this situation, we see that there is the International Space Station shown to you and you have to find out the total mechanical energy which is possessed by a 60 kg astronaut who is inside the International Space Station. The International Space Station is orbiting the Earth at a height of 400 km from the surface of the Earth. You can take the radius of the Earth to be 6400 km and the mass of the Earth to be 5.98 into 10 to the power of 24 kg. Also, you have to find the orbital velocity of the International Space Station. The solution to this question can be found out by considering that the total energy possessed by the astronaut in the International Space Station is given by the formula minus g m m by 2 r. Putting the values of g, m and small m as well as the orbital radius of the International Space Station, we get the total energy possessed by the astronaut as equal to minus 2.35 into 10 to the power of 9 joule. The orbital velocity of International Space Station can be calculated as equal to root of 
g m by r and this is equal to 7.66 kilometer per second. The negative sign over here shows that the astronaut is bound to the earth. This is the energy which must be provided to the astronaut to escape from the earth's gravitational pull. Since the International Space Station is very close to the earth, its velocity is very high. It can go around the earth in only about 90 minutes. Now we have another situation in which you see the moon of Mars which is Phobos and it is rotating around Mars. The moon of Mars Phobos orbits around Mars with an orbital radius of 9380 kilometer. Its orbital period is only 0.319 earth days which is equivalent to 2.77 into 10 to the power of 4 seconds. From this data given to you, you have to determine the mass of Mars. The solution to this question can be found out using the Kepler's law of periods and the data given for the time period and the orbital radius of Phobos. The time period was given as 2.77 into 10 to the power of 4 seconds and the orbital radius as equal to 9380 kilometers. Putting it into the formula t square is equal to 4 pi square r cube upon gm we have the mass of Mars as equal to 4 pi square r cube upon gt square which yields the answer as equal to 6.39 into 10 to the power of 23 kg. Hence, we see that from the time period and the orbital radius of a satellite orbiting a planet, we can find the mass of the planet. This method is widely used to find the mass of planets of the solar system and even outside the solar system. Here we see a geostationary satellite which is GSAT-11. This is a satellite which is made by ISRO and ISRO wants to launch this satellite. You have to determine the orbital radius of this geostationary satellite. Also, you can find the orbital speed and the escape speed of the geostationary satellite. And we can also determine the centripetal acceleration experienced by this geostationary satellite which will be launched by ISRO. The solution to this question of the geostationary satellite is again found out by using the Kepler's law of periods and from this formula we get r cube is equal to g m t square by 4 pi square and here the data gives the answer for the orbital radius of the geostationary satellite GSAT-11 as equal to 42,164 kilometers. The orbital speed of the satellite comes out to be equal to 3.07 kilometer per second using the formula that the orbital speed is equal to root gm by r. The escape speed of the geostationary satellite is equal to 
root 2 times the orbital speed and it is equal to 4.34 km per second. From the above data, we can easily calculate the centripetal acceleration of the geostationary satellite GSAT-11 and it is equal to V square by R and the answer comes out to be 0.223 km per second square. GSAT-11 since it is a geostationary satellite, it will complete one orbit in every 24 hours because the orbital period is synchronized with the Earth's rotational period. A geostationary satellite can always be found in the same position in the sky relative to an observer on Earth. Hence, it is very useful for communication purposes. I hope that this module has clarified many of your concepts on gravitation. And now you will be able to do numericals on gravitation comfortably. Thank you.